Hey everyone, today we're going to be talking about His Dark Materials Episode 4, Armor. Just a reminder, there are always spoilers in my videos, so if you haven't seen the episode or you haven't read the books and you care, please stop now. I don't want to ruin anything for anyone who isn't up for it, so fair warning. This was probably the episode I was most looking forward to and also most dreading, and I think a lot of people probably agree on that. We're all very excited to meet Yorick and to meet Lee Scoresby, who's one of the series' most beloved characters and I know for myself I was very apprehensive about how HBO and BBC would deal with both of these. When I heard that Lin-Manuel Miranda was cast as Lee Scoresby, I was extremely disappointed. At the time, I thought he was not the right fit. I wanted to come to this with an open mind, but I just can't. I just can't with him. I want to be very clear that I have nothing against Lin-Manuel Miranda, personally or professionally. I have not seen Hamilton. I know that he is very, very well loved by so much of the country, and he he is extremely popular and extremely talented, but I do not think that he is right for the character of Lee Scoresby. Sam Elliott, who played Lee Scoresby in the 2007 adaptation, really has my heart. I think he is the perfect actor for that role, and Lin-Manuel Miranda is such a departure from this kind of dry, weathered, older gentleman who is a man of few words. Lin-Manuel Miranda is a man of many words, and I think his experience with Broadway makes him such a large, powerful actor. Everything he does is big, everything he does is very dramatic, and I don't know how well that plays on the small screen. I'm going to go ahead and give this episode a B. If I'm feeling stingy, B minus. There were so many things that I really loved about this episode. I thought the set designers knocked it out of the park when it came to the town of Trollesund. It was so well done. I thought it was an incredibly effective depiction of a small port town in the middle of nowhere where people really don't want to hang out. I also thought the special effects that went into Yurik were incredible. I loved the scars on his nose that kind of implied he has a past, which we will come to learn about more, I'm sure. Another thing I did love about this episode is that I felt like we finally got to see Lyra in her element. We finally got to see her spinning some tall tales, manipulating the situation, and really maneuvering all of the pieces around her to get what she wants. I loved seeing her exert her power in that way and kind of sculpt the adults around her. I thought it was brilliant and it was finally the character I was looking for, finally the girl who could be remarkable, who is extraordinary, coming out to shine. What I did not love was how this really felt like an episode for Lynn manuel Miranda. What could have been a relatively small series of scenes turned into an entire hour-long episode, and it was really so we could see Lynn manuel Miranda getting into hijinks, causing problems, and oozing personality all over the place. This episode should not have been about Lee Scoresby, and I feel like it was and I'm a little bit salty about it. We start the episode by looking at these beautiful clouds and spotting a hot air balloon. This is of course Lee's balloon, and we see Lee and Hester observing Trollesund below them, and Lee starts to sing. This was an immediate trigger for me. I am not a fan of musicals, and I know that might make me a bad person, but I just thought, kill me now. I cannot believe they're turning this into a musical, and I was really delighted when the song ended, but I felt like they got Lin-Manuel Miranda, they gotta make him sing somehow. Lee is looking at the Egyptian boat below and he tells Hester it looks like we might have company in Trollesund. He makes it very clear from the beginning that he is really going to Trollesund to pursue Yorick. He's been looking for Yorick and he knows that Yorick has had his armor stolen. When Lee lands in Trollesund, he is greeted by the Sisselmen of the town and after asking the Sisselmen if he knows about Yorick and being told that the Sisselmen Sisselman has already heard of Lee's reputation, he goes ahead and he steals the Sisselman's pocket watch. It becomes immediately clear that Lee's character is really here for comic relief, and Hester is pretty exasperated with him and says, do we really have to go through this again? Why can't you behave? While I understand the need for comic relief in what is otherwise a very serious story, this definitely rubbed me the wrong way. Part of Lee's character in the books is that he is such a genuine, authentic, kind person. His words 
Edward is really what he's good for. He's really a man of integrity and that does not include pickpocketing. I know this is a really small point, but I did notice somehow that Hester as Lee's demon looks a little bit more cartoonish than the other demons. I think it's because her eyes are a little bit bigger, but she does look almost funny. Having very recently watched the 2007 adaptation, I couldn't help but notice the difference in the two hairs. As the Egyptians land in Trollocend, Farder Coram decides to take Lyra with him to go meet the witch consul, Dr. Lancelius. Shout out to my namesake. He asks Lyra about her ability to read the alethiometer and impresses on her just how important it is that she does a good job. And we get to hear Lyra describe her method for reading the alethiometer. The magisterium really is everywhere in Trollocend. And as Lyra is getting out the alethiometer to read it, we see all of these kind of shadowy figures across the town watching her and watching the Egyptians. Farder Coram and Lyra visit Dr. Lancelius in his shack. They go in and Dr. Lancelius makes them coffee and sets them down to hear whatever it is they have to say. Farder Coram says he's trying to get in touch with Serafina Pecola and he and the Egyptians are going north to find the gobblers. They have a very blunt conversation about what that could mean. I love Dr. Lancelius. I didn't really know what he would look like in the series, but I'm so glad that we get to see him. And I love his bright green serpent demon. Dr. Lancelius tells Farder Coram that he definitely knows that something big is happening and that the kids who arrive in Trollocend don't stay there for long. He knows that they're being taken north and that wherever it is they're being taken, the station, aka Bolvangar, they're being subject to something called the Maestat process or intercision. Dr. Lancelius asks Lyra about the alethiometer and her experience with it. She says, I can read this. He says, how do you have the books? And she says, no, I don't need them. Dr. Lancelius has obviously heard about Lyra and knows something more about her that he is not saying. So he asks for a demonstration of her reading the alethiometer. And as in the book, he takes her to where he keeps all of the witches, Cloud Pine, and asks her to determine which sprig of Cloud Pine is Serafina's. I really loved the scene. I loved that he has this basement full of tiny jars full of tree branches. We see Lyra asking the alethiometer which sprig belongs to Serafina. She identifies it and as a parting gift, Dr. Lancelius gives her a tiny piece of the sprig and says, if you need Serafina, this is how you can reach her. We then see Lyra ask Dr. Lancelius, what should we ask you? Which is one of Lyra's greatest, most masterful moves in my opinion. And he seems to think so too. He offers her a very knowing smile and says, if I were you, I would hire an armored bear. And he tells Lyra and Farder Coram about Yorick. One thing that happens in the book that we don't see in this scene is Dr. Lancelius telling Farder Coram about the witch prophecy that has to do with Lyra and that they've heard about her for centuries. They know that she is the one child, essentially. Farder Coram and Lyra find their way to where Yorick is working, ripping apart metal pieces. They have an interesting conversation with him. This is the first time that we see Yorick. It is a pretty magical magical moment. After Farder Coram asks Yurik if he will go with them and he's turned down, Lyra gets a little bit confrontational and decides it's a great idea to imply that he is a coward for not coming with them. Yurik responds by getting extremely close to Lyra's face and to her credit, Lyra does not flinch immediately. This was really when we see Lyra in her element, mastering her fear and being brave. Bravery is when we're afraid and we do something anyway and I think this really really showed us how strong she is and how determined she is. I liked that for a second Yurik seems to almost smell Lyra. I think it was a very subtle way to imply that though he can talk, Yurik is not a human. Part of his sensory experience and his, his way of trusting people comes from smell. I thought that was really cool. For me, the scene was also the beginning of what we know will be a great relationship between these two. This is another adult in Lyra's life who can guide her, who can teach her, who can protect her. From here we see Mrs. Coulter entering the magisterium wearing a bright red dress suit. Unlike all of the men dressed in black around her, she is not afraid to stand out and she goes there presumably to receive her punishment from the cardinal for her takeover of Jordan College. The only indication that she might be at all nervous about this is actually her golden monkey demon. He looks pretty scared and he tries to take her hand, which she promptly 
simply slaps away like the cold-hearted lady she is. She is greeted by Father McPhail and he tears her a new one telling her that she had absolutely no right to invade Jordan College in the way that she did and break the hundred year long relationship they have. He especially goes on about how she violated the principle of scholastic sanctuary. She does not particularly care. We finally see the Cardinal enter the room and he reminds me a bit of the Master of Whispers in Game of Thrones. He has a way of subtly cutting people down with a smile. When she asks the Cardinal what her punishment will be, the Cardinal tells her punishment is a strange word and then proceeds to inform her that he is giving the Gobbler project to Father McPhail entirely, that she will have absolutely no magisterium credentials beyond this and she's done. Mrs. Coulter responds by clapping and saying what a great performance that was and let me tell you all the reasons that this isn't happening. She has Lord Israel imprisoned. She's not going anywhere. She is retaining control of the General Oblation Board. And not only that, she gets to ask Fra Pavel a question from the Alethiometer and she demands all of these things right now. This is a great power move and we see the atmosphere in the Magisterium change as soon as she has this mic drop moment. She even sits down and invites the Cardinal and Father McPhail to sit down with her so that she can discuss the finer points. Mrs. Coulter talked about dominating other people and harnessing power and we really see her doing exactly that in this scene. Great job Marissa. After their encounter with Yurik, Bartokorum tells Lyra that he wasn't so sure she should have been quite as bold around Yurik as she was and that Yurik could have ripped her throat out. Lyra doesn't seem surprised by this but tells Bartokorum that she knows who to trust. She also says that it would be more damaging for her not to trust anyone than for her to trust a polar bear. We then see them have a conversation about Serafina Pekala and Farter Quorum's relationship with her. Farter Quorum tells Lyra the truth and that he had been in love with her, they'd had a child, and that the child had died. He references Yambe Aka here, which I thought was really cool. Farter Quorum is clearly still pretty broken up about both his relationship with Serafina and also the loss of his son, and Lyra tries her best to comfort him. Him. We see them kind of holding each other tenderly. And then we get to my least favorite scene. We see Lee Scoresby with Hester walk into the bar in Trollesund. He tries to talk to the locals there. He makes some very corny jokes. He tries to play cards with people and they are just having absolutely none of it. He reveals that he's trying to learn about Yurik Bernison and he is not at all well received. Eventually he starts a bar fight and we see Hester kind of navigating the fight from a distance. I liked this relationship between Hester and Lee and we see that they're collaborating together. This is obviously something that happens frequently. The thing that made me ask some questions though is we know demons and humans are connected. So when we see Lee Scoresby taking a punch being, you know, cracked over the head, why didn't we see Hester be physically hurt? I didn't think the director and the producers really thought this through. I also couldn't help but notice that we really didn't see many other demons in the bar and we didn't see the demons fighting with Hester. This seems like an oversight. It seems like a really obvious one though. After Lee gets kicked out of the bar, Hester is like, dude, why you keep doing this? And he reveals that he started this fight so he could steal a bunch of wallets and pocket watches. This is not the Lee that I know and love, but this is the Lee that we're getting. Mrs. Coulter enters the room where Fra Pavel and his Eleutheometer are and we see her ask her question of him. She asks asks Fra Pavel, who is Lyra Belacqua? And Fra Pavel seems pretty startled because if anyone should know who Lyra is, it should definitely be her mother. On kind of a logistical level, I thought this was a really cool scene because we get to see the Magisterium's alethiometer. We see how different it is from the one that Lyra has and that it's permanently set in the Magisterium. We also see that Fra Pavel is using books. So even though he is the official alethiometrist, he still does not have the dexterity or the instinctive knowledge that Lyra has with it. Lee is standing in the middle of Trollesund yelling, screaming about Yurik when he finally runs into Lyra and Farter Quorum walking. Lee gets the impression that Lyra knows where Yurik is and he asks her pretty much straight out and she says she actually doesn't want to tell him because she thinks that he's going to take Yurik and she wants to take Yurik instead. Night falls in Trollesund and we see Farter Quorum and John Fa taking a walk around the town. They're talking about Lyra and how important 
observant she is. We see a white bird flying through the sky and we come to realize that this is Kaisa, who is Serafina Pecola's demon. Kaisa lands and he says hello to Farder Quorum and John Fa, and we see Farder Quorum actually bowing to him. There's a definite sense of respect. Kaisa tells Farder Quorum that the witches from Serafina's clan will be happy to assist them in whatever they're doing. They already know a little bit about what's going on up north. We know that Trollisund is very far north because we finally get to see Lyra and Pan looking at the Aurora Borealis in the sky. They're kind of nestled up against the boat and they're watching the green and blue of the Aurora, dreaming about what it might mean and kind of settling into the reality that the adventure that they've been looking forward to is finally here. We also get a tiny glimpse of Chita Gadze in the Aurora and Lyra sees it as well and says, I wonder what that is. I wonder what all of this is made of. Maybe it's made of dust. After searching the town for hours, Lee Scoresby and Hester finally locate Yorick. We learn that it's been three years since they've seen each other and as Yorick says, the last three years were not very kind years to him. He is drunk, he's ashamed, and he's done things that he does not want to talk about. Lee says, we couldn't judge you, we wouldn't judge you. And I thought that was actually very well done because it reminds us that Lee is not alone. Lee and Hester are always together and that is something that Yorick doesn't have. He doesn't have a demon, he doesn't have a constant companion, and that makes his loss of his armor even more impactful because for him his armor really is his soul. Yorick is not receptive to this and basically tells him leave me the hell alone. To his credit Lee is not done trying to help his friend and the very next morning he shows up at the Sisselman's office and tries to convince the Sisselman that he actually has the deed so to speak to Yorick's armor because he won it off of Yorick in a card game. The Sisselman is having none of this and he actually gets pretty hostile after showing Lee the Magisterium paperwork. He says that this is a blood debt that Yurik is working off. The Sisselman is really tired of Lee trying to pull one over him and he gets out again and basically says, I don't believe you, you're insulting my intelligence, now get the hell out of my office. And when he sees the gun, Lee finally complies. He does tell the Sisselman though, before he leaves, that Yurik is a bear and he can't be a slave to anyone. I liked this line because I think it really shows us that Yurik is a wild animal and he deserves to be free he can't be contained and the situation is just wrong. Mrs. Coulter is rehearsing her speech to Yofer, who we later find out is the king of the bears in Svalbard and there's a very brief moment when she tells the golden monkey, hey I don't need your help I got this. And we see again how distant their relationship is and how much she tries not to depend on him. Poor little dude. She does mention in her speech that she is the person behind the false imprisonment debt situation with Yurik Bernison. This is something that we find out quite a bit later in the books, but we know immediately almost that this whole Yurik being drunk all the time and being kept in this small town is something bigger than we think it is. Lyra consults the alethiometer about Yurik's situation and after finding out that he's been tricked out of his armor she decides to take matters into her own hands. In a pretty weird scene we see Boreal at the Magisterium again and he is assaulting Fra Pavel, the Magisterium alethiometrist. He first threatens Fra Pavel and says that he needs to know what Mrs. Coulter asked him but then he changes course and says he has his own question for Fra Pavel. He calls Fra Pavel ratty and it's because his demon is a rat, a stun but then he alludes to Frau Pavel's shady past and says he knows all about his filthy predilections. We can only assume what this means. My guess is some kind of pedophilia. This definitely seems like Lord Boreal's modus operandi. He likes pushing people around and he decides that his question is that he wants to know how he can find whatever it is that Grumman himself discovered. His obsession with Grumman is seemingly all-consuming and I think we're we're supposed to understand that these two men are particularly linked together. Pan reminds Lyra that there is one person in the town of Trollisund who actually knows Yurik, so they scramble into the bar and sit down with Lee while he eats his breakfast. This was one of my favorite scenes despite Lin-Manuel Miranda being Lin-Manuel Miranda and doing his thing. I loved watching Lyra steal his bacon and kind of test the waters of their dynamic. She talks about how she likes to play cards and how when she has the worst hand 
it's actually an opportunity to bluff magnificently. That's really who Lyra is. She is a bluffer, she is a storyteller, and she is a liar, and her confidence is disarming. It's Leah who tells her that war is the sea that Yurik swims in, the air that he breathes, and that his armor is really his soul. It's his equivalent to his demon, and that it's as important to Yurik as Hester is to Lee. Hester doesn't seem to like that answer, but she accepts it. Also, there is a very random pinball machine. It doesn't take Lyra long to find Yurik again and to tell him she finally knows where his armor is. She asks him why, since he works with metal all day every day, he can't just make some more armor, and he explains to her that this armor was made for him by him, and that it was made from sky metal. Lyra shows Yurik the alethiometer, and we see Yurik sniffing it again. As soon as Yurik agrees to come to help the Egyptians after he has his armor, he tells Lyra that if anyone tries to fight him when he recovers it, he will take vengeance. That if someone tries to stop him, they will die. And Lyra says, that seems fair. Yurik rips through the town of Trollesund and he makes his way to the oratory where they are keeping his armor. The Magisterium, the Sisselman, all of the police show up with guns ready, guns ablazing. Yurik emerges wearing his armor and he is formidable. He was scary without it, but with it he is truly terrifying. It's rusty, it's dented, it is not beautiful armor, but it is bulletproof, and he starts shaking off all of the bullets. He swipes a paw at the men that are shooting at him, and they go flying. He is obviously so much stronger than anyone, and he very easily topples the Sisselman. We see him with his paw, his gigantic paw, on the Sisselman's head, and he is about to crack it like an egg, as is described in the book. Lyra intervenes and says, hey, we can walk away from here. This doesn't have to lead somewhere even worse. Let's just stop what we're doing. Lee Scoresby also shows up and he tells Yurik that it's probably time to go. They should both be heading over to the Egyptians who are packing up and getting ready to leave. Yurik seems okay with this and he follows Lyra and Lee back to the harbor. Lyra finds the Egyptians all packed up and ready to go and when she reveals to John Fa that she's bringing some extra friends, he is not very pleased or impressed. She tries to get away with this and she does get away with this by saying that Yurik is basically Egyptian. He's been mistreated and tricked just like the Egyptians have always been, so that makes him practically Egyptian just like her. I thought this was Lyra at her finest. This was really her manipulating the situation to get what she wanted. Lee goes forth with his sales pitch. He was under the impression that John Fa had actually wanted to hire him, but we soon realize this is just one of Lyra's tricks and that they know nothing about Lee or his his balloons. John Fa is not an easy customer and we see him look Lee Scoresby up and down, but he finally accepts and he agrees that both Lee Scoresby and Yurik Bernison can come along. They will be valuable members of the search party. We're then taken to Svalbard and we see Mrs. Coulter in heels walk through a dimly lit cave and she talks to this hidden figure for quite some time. We come to learn that it's Yofer Ragnason who is the king of Svalbard and the king of the bears there. He is really the one who has Lord Azrael under his control and Mrs. Coulter is there not only to butter Yofer up but also to complain that they're treating Lord Azrael just a little bit too well. She says that they need to tear down his lab, basically treat him like the prisoner that he is. Yofer reminds Mrs. Coulter that he is king and that Mrs. Coulter is not his queen and that he will be the one making the rules. We see Mrs. Coulter bow down to the king King, and she realizes she needs to change her tactics here. She then offers him the ultimate prize for Yofer. She tells him that as a gift for doing all of these amazing things for her, she will convince the Magisterium to baptize him into the church. The episode ends with the Egyptian party, along with Lee Scoresby and Yorick Bernison, walking into the north. It actually seems like a very hopeful scene, even though we know the odds are stacked against them. Just a few parting thoughts. We are officially halfway through season one of His Dark Materials. Uh, season one and season two are each eight episodes and this marks the end of episode four. I think a lot has been crammed into all four episodes including things that we don't see until much later in the books. I think we're set up for success but I do think that this episode was a little bit longer and a little bit more detailed than it needed to be and that I blame Lin-Manuel Miranda for that. I really want to see Lee as someone who is a little bit quieter, who's a a little bit more reserved and a little bit more calculated.
isolated. I don't need so much charm, so much pizzazz, and so many jokes. I am excited though. I think Lyra's character is really finally taking shape and we are seeing her for the tremendous girl that she is. I'm excited to see what happens next as we venture further north and we finally get to see some of the weird creepy crawlies that live in the forests. I'm sure we'll be seeing the witches soon. Thanks again for tuning in. I hope you didn't hate this too much. Happy Thanksgiving for anyone in the US.